Oh, somebody needs to shut this light off. I guess, yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, we had a uh, mistake in our sound system last week. We apologize to those that are on the internet, and so I'm going to reteach on Psalm 149, and I've got, you know, I've added some things to it. Um, but that was going to be my teaching this morning because it is so vitally important, and since we've already been talking about uh, praise and worship, because uh, that's what it's about. And so many people. Um, come to church wanting entertainment. So it becomes difficult to put on a service where you're trying to gain salvation when most of the people that come in are looking to be entertained. And, you know, when, when we were uh, belong to the religious organization that we belong to here in town, one of the things that the leaders always said was, that, some of them that were saying, oh, they want to change, they want to change, they want to change. Well, unfortunately, you know, we didn't interpret what they really meant. See, to us, change means salvation. To us, change means that you get delivered of your human desires and fears and get God's desires. That's what salvation is. Well, their idea of change was, how can we make our church services more entertaining to bring people in to keep people interested? Because, see, most people aren't interested in salvation. They get bored with church. Even, even a, a, a real salvation message, I mean, I, I don't blame people for being bored with church, most church, because it's not anointed and there's not a salvation message. They're not trying to bring people into salvation. They're just trying to get a service done so they can get it done and get out and start living in the world and start doing their stuff. And see, we're not here to try to get, we're not in a hurry here, we're not trying to get done here. As long as God is moving, we want to stay here. But if God's not moving let's go home you know and I'm always one that's you know if God's moving I don't mind staying here we've stayed here as long as till five o'clock in the evening don't get frightened <laughs> don't get afraid we, we knew ahead of time but there's been times we've been out at four three thirty and four but that's because we stay here and pray after service and a lot of times that can get pretty lengthy if God's moving but if God's not moving then let's go home you know uh, we're willing to stay when God is moving but what those leaders wanted was they wanted to find they wanted change because people were bored out of, they couldn't get any young people they they were bored out of their gourd and they wanted to figure out how can we make this more entertaining so what they start doing is they start bringing in worldliness into the church they start bringing in visual um, things that excite the eyes you know visual things that excite the eyes because we are a visually oriented people the problem is, is that faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. And so we've got, and most of the church, even the charismatic church doesn't realize that. Because they'll tell you, well, watch these miracles and let your faith grow. Your faith doesn't grow by what you see. Faith comes by hearing God speak. And one of these days I'm hoping the church, I mean, the church has got to get it someday. Because in order to, to have uh, the bride perfect without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, we can't be continuing to, to operate in humanistic concepts and get people in faith. It's not going to happen. So if you turn with me to Psalm 149, if you want to, I'm going to try to read uh, sometimes out of the New King James, sometimes out of the NIV, and I hope I don't flip back and forth. Well, because I, like I said, I've got this parallel Bible, and... Uh, Sometimes I just, I go from one to the other. Okay, first one in Psalm 149, it says, Praise the Lord. I'm going to stop right there. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, well, possibly. And praise means, or if you feel like it, praise means to be foolishly clamorous. Anybody here ever been foolishly clamorous? It means to be loud. It means to be boastful. It means to be emotional. It means to be boastful in our God. Loud with color, with sound. Anybody ever here been foolishly clamorous over anything? Anybody ever go to the football games? The people out there are foolishly clamorous. Even the adults are. They carry, you know, I don't know if they still do this, but I know years ago they used to have milk jugs and they'd fill them with rocks. 
And they'd stand up and they'd shake them like this, as, as big loud shakers, you know. And I've watched adults follow the cheerleaders. You know, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. And all the adults would stand up and sit down and they'd, and they'd just whatever the cheerleaders say. Remember, remember what the cheerleaders used to say, all right, now all you people, let's, let's do this, you know. See, and what do they call it? They call that team spirit. Well, we're coming out here after the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit likes people to be foolishly clamorous. So when we sing, when we praise, and I don't know if we have any praise songs. Lately, we've been, the songs have been fairly, you know, most of them have been worship. They haven't been real hard-driving songs. But when we have hard-driving songs, sometimes we can get foolishly clamorous. People can dance. They'll run around the room. They throw their hands up in the air. They'll twirl. That's foolishly clamorous. It's a command. And I'm just going to throw this in here now. Might as well because I'm going to start this out so we'll start it out correctly. I've shared this before. This is one of the reasons I don't like the term, and you're not going to put this together right away until I explain it. That's why I don't like the term legalism. I've explained to you before, I don't like the term legalism. I know how people use it. But what it does is it creates an attitude inside of us that we don't have to be legal about anything. And I got news for you, there's a legal spiritual way to do things with the kingdom of God. And this is one of them. Praise is one of them. You know, we can, we can go through the Bible and we can find out where people did illegal things. And God was not pleased with it. And when I say illegal things, I'm not talking about what you would consider to be sin. I'm talking about they did illegal religious things. Remember Saul's unlawful sacrifice. That was a religious thing, but it was unlawful. It wasn't legal. Uh, who were the two sons of uh, Aaron? Who, was, who were they? Elihu and who and Abinadab or somebody like that. They offered what? They offered strange fire, remember? And what happened to them? They did something illegal. There was a king, I don't remember if he's in First or Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles, and he uh, went in and he, did, he tried to make an offering. He tried to do something that the priests always do. And leprosy broke out all over him. And he was a leper till the day of his death. We find that David, remember David was a man after God's own heart. David was a, a good guy, wasn't he? He wasn't a bad guy, was he? He tried to bring, a cart back, or tried to bring the ark back on a new cart. And what happened? He did something illegal. He did it wrong. And we find that Jesus said, when people came up to him and said, yeah, but didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we, uh, what was it, cast out demons in your name? And what did he say? He said, depart from me. This is what the New King James says. He says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And so when we use the term legal, I know what people mean, and I don't want to get in an in a argument about words, but I think we need to change our wording around, because when we come up with legalism, you know, every time I've talked with somebody outside of this church, or almost every time, and you start talking about reading your Bible, or attending church, or praying, or something, the first thing they're going to hit you with is, well, I don't want to get into that legalism. As though we can do things our way, and God is going to be pleased with it. That's what it creates in us. It creates in us this attitude that we can do things our way and God is still going to accept it. We learned last week, and I think I'm going to go there. We've only read one scripture, right? Praise the Lord. Yes. Well, let's go to uh, Genesis. Because we're going to read about another unlawful. Genesis chapter 4. Well, I mentioned it last week. I think it would be good to read it. Verse 1. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV now. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. 
So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Now, before we go any further, what happened here is that Abel, notice there's some key words in here, Abel gave of the first. Cain gave some. And see, I, I'm, listen, the word legalism has created in, in uh, uh, the church this idea that God is happy with some. So I talk to anybody, and they're going to tell you that God is happy with the way they praise God. Even if they just sit there and mouth some words, they're, they're going to say, well, God accepts me the same way he does you. Isn't that, isn't, don't, haven't we created a, a, a Christianity that seems to be now all-inclusive of everything? Legalism isn't even in Scripture, by the way. It's not a biblical word. But it's, it's trying to describe something, and I think it's just a poor choice of words. It's no different, and I always get upset when people use that word. I also get upset when people use the word saved, the way we use it now. Because it, it creates in people this idea that it's a finished product. Well, I got saved 20, I accepted Jesus 20 years ago. Yeah, but what are you saved from? Are you still being driven by all the world's fears and desires? If you are, then you haven't been saved at all. You may have gotten born again. May. I don't know if you did. You may have gotten born again, but you haven't been saved of anything. Because salvation is something that we obtain here on the earth. We get saved from fear. Some of the people here in this body here can tell you things that they've been saved from. Things that used to drive them. Things that used to form their personalities things that used to run their lives are no longer there. Their personalities really haven't changed. What's happened is the personality that they really had is now starting to come out. It's not that God changes your personality. You, most people that are in the world don't even know what their real personality is because it's being driven by fear and, and by, by worldly desires. If you take those things away, the real personality of the person comes out. People that were, uh, you've ever often heard of people, well, you know, they're, they're kind of shy and quiet. You ever heard of that type of personality? May not be shy and quiet, they may be fearful. Take that fear away and see what happens to them. They may be real talkative. They could be really loud people. They could be really uh, flamboyant people. It's just that fear has kept their personality locked in. And so Cain gave some, and we've created this, this idea that, that, that legalism, it, it creates a concept in us that, well, we really don't have to be legal about anything. There's not a real legality. There is in the spirit realm. There's a legality. I'm not talking about humanistic or the letter. I'm talking about there's a legalistic uh, concept in the spirit realm that we have to obey, and this is one of them. Let me ask you a question. I mean, we're going to read it here in a minute, and we've read it so many times here before in Psalms. It says that God will beautify the humble with salvation when, he's ta when we're talking about praise. All right, let me ask you this. Will you get beautified with salvation if you don't praise according to the way God says to do it? So there's a legal way of doing it, isn't it? I hear people use that term, and, and, I, and saved, you know, well, I got saved five years ago. I got saved, and even preachers who know better, who know what real salvation is, use that terminology, and it always reinforces in us, oh, well, they're okay then. We're okay, because I got saved. You didn't get saved. You might have got born again. In fact, the Bible teaches us if you really did get born again and you don't get saved, you don't enter into the process of salvation, your end is worse at the end than it was if you'd never known. So if you really did get born again, my advice to you, I don't know what that means, and I'm not going to preach on that today, but my advice to you, if you really did get born again, you better start entering into salvation. Because the end doesn't sound too good if you don't. If you take what God gave you and then waste it. Well, I, I could, but I'm not sure. What does anybody, you know what salvation means here, don't you? Well, I was going to give it when I went to beautify salvation, but I can give it now. <clears throat> what is salvation? <coughs> Rescue, healing. 
Healing, prosperity, prosperity, safety, deliverance, soul peace. All good? (laughs) All good stuff, huh? That'd be a good definition. All good stuff. (laughs) It's not really Greek, though, is it? (laughs) See, people are, are, uh, and, 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 you know, I I think about... uh, the teens today, the, the young people, you know, we had a youth group here, here a while back and had some of the other youth from the other churches, and I think, you know, so many of them are going through so many things, supposedly. You know, they're on medicines, they're on, on uh, antidepressants, they're on all of the, they've got all this supposed peer pressure and everything. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be delivered of all of that? Without the drugs. Well, that's what salvation can do. It works, and it works every time. If, you'll, if you will be legalistic about it. Ah. <laughs> it's hard to... It, it, see, I can hear people cringing with that word because of what's been planted in us that it means. And it, like I said, it's not a biblical term. So I can use it any way I choose to use it. You're just going to have to break the stronghold of what it means in you. You see what I'm saying? So I think we need to be, well, like, and I've said this before, if you're not legalistic, you're what? Illegal. You're illegalistic. Well, what's the opposite? You're illegal. And I just think we need to change that. I think we need to find a better term. You know, what we do is we call it, this is, this is what I do, is, is I just call it operating in the letter. You know, when I've got a title in one of my Bibles that says, not legalism, but Christ. They, they put it in the Bible, you know, under one of their titles. And I said, really, all Paul was trying to do, this is the whole basis of what Paul was trying to do with the Jews, was he was trying to get them to get off of what God had said and get them on to God, what God was saying today. See, we operate in what God has said, which is the letter which doesn't work. We read the letter. Why do we read the letter? So to know if what we're hearing is God speaking. And God can speak through the letter, but we don't, op- we don't operate in the letter. We operate in what God is saying. That's called faith. So let's just continue on here. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Now, I want you to catch these emotions here. Why is your face downcast if you do what is right or legal? (laughs) Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin or illegal, (laughs) sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So we find right here, almost, you know, God is almost speaking like sin is a living thing. And its desire, listen, its desire is to have you. And you, and that's what it says, and you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. He didn't do a very good job of ruling, did he? While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Isn't that nice? You get a word from the Lord. God speaks directly to you. (laughs) And you immediately go out and disobey it. (laughs) How many times, Kelly? (laughs) How many times can we count? People have gotten a direct word from God. And they immediately run out and disobey it. I didn't really want to focus on that, but it's good stuff anyway. But what I did want to focus on was that notice that Cain killed Abel. And why did he kill him? Because Abel gave first and Cain gave some. And something I shared last week is that those who give some will always kill those who give of the first. They always get angry. Their countenance falls. They always get angry. Now, when I say kill... It could be physical. Here it was physical, right? You actually physically kill. And that can happen. But they're going to kill you with their tongue. They're going to kill you with mocking, looks, innuendos, 
slander, libel. Somehow they're going to try to get you to, get, to be like them and to only give some. And we've created in America a God who's happy with some. And that God does not exist. He wants the first. Listen, he didn't say all. He didn't say all. He said, I want your first. Now the first of what? So, can we say he wants the first of my emotions? Is it wrong to go out there and cheer the football team? No. But it's wrong to go out there and give your first to the football team and then come to church and just stand there like this. Now, who's getting your first? The football team. Listen, if you can come in here and you can jump and shout and be foolishly clamorous for God, by all means, go out and jump and shout and be foolishly clamorous for 22 kids that run a dead pig up and down the field. I, listen, it's, sometimes I see some good plays. But you're going to find once you start giving your first to God, those things aren't going to matter as much. And what's going to happen is you'll give your first to God and you'll give some to the football game. See what I mean? You'll give first to God. You'll give some. See, I'm a big deer hunter. For those who don't know. <laughs> well, they're on the Internet. They don't know me. I'm speaking to them, not you guys. <laughs> I love to hunt deer. Love to, love to bow hunt. Love to hunt deer. But deer hunting only gets some. God gets first. And that's what you're going to find is what happens. You'll give some to this and some to this, but God's going to get your first. He's going to get the first of your strength. When was the last time you gave your first of your strength to God? How many of you give your strength to things? Anybody, any, well, I know Joseph, he's a weightlifter. That takes some strength, doesn't it? Any hobbies here? Anybody got any hobbies? How about shopping? Anybody give any strength to shopping? No? 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 <laughs> Kathy goes, yeah, I do. <laughs> How about eating? <laughs> Boy, I got, got him that time, didn't I, Bethel? <laughs> See, so... See, some of you guys shouldn't give testimonies because, you know, other <laughs> stuff stays with me. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We give the first of our, a lot of times we'll give the first of our strength. And, and like I say, you have to look in your own life what you give the first of your strength to. What, is, what are you focused on? What is your mind thinking about all the time? Sports, um, you know, career, money making, money itself, uh, human desires, lust. How about, how about lust? Can you give your first to that? Yep. Not just in people, but lust of anything. Yeah. And God wants your first. Oh, yeah. And when you, get, when you give him your first, then you get accepted. And when we're talking about first, right now we're going to be talking about praise. So he wants the first of your praise, which is your emotions, your foolishly clamorous. Really, the first commandment covers it. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with what? All, All your... Heart, soul, strength, mind. Yeah. <laughs> you guys found me up. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Yeah. And soul means your mind, your will, and your emotions. And very few people do that with all their strength. And he wants the first of it. You know, obviously, folks, he doesn't want it all. We have jobs to go to, right? That requires some strength. Now, you can work to the, as unto the Lord in that job, but you're still applying strength for some. Some of us work for other people, right? Well, most of us work for other people. And so when you work for other, you're actually doing a job for them, right? And you work as unto the Lord, but you're still applying strength for them. So I'm not saying God wants it all, but he wants the first. And you've got to understand something. This applies, this first and some uh, concept applies all the, way, all the way through church. It doesn't just apply through praise. All the Cains are not going to like people who give the first of their money. 
who give the first of their strength or the first of their praise or the first of their church attendance. In other words, the Canes who show up most of the time aren't going to like the ones who are really excited and show up all the time. And there's always going to, you're going to feel that Cain spirit come upon you. You know what I mean? Everybody goes, yeah, because you probably felt it a lot. This is one of Cain's favorite sayings. You've heard this before. They're so spiritually minded, they're no earthly good. That's a, Cain, that's a favorite of Cain right there. Cain loves that. Because what's that do to you? When you hear it, see, that's another one of those wonderful sayings. What's that do to you? Makes you want to back down and just start giving some. Because I don't want to get too carried away with this. Want to make you back down. See, Cain's objective is, is if, he can't kill, if he can't kill you physically, is to get you to back, back down to the way he is and just give some, which is really, it's the devil through Cain, isn't it? Because the devil wants your first. The devil doesn't care if you give some to God. He cares if you give your first to God. Do you know why? Yeah, because if you give your first to God, the devil's days are numbered. If you only give some to God, the devil's going to have rule over your life for the rest of your life. Get used to it. I don't care how, you can give as much sum as you want to God, you're going to be ruled by the, by the devil. And that's why he's always trying to, see the devil's, see the devil's plan is he doesn't want entering, anybody entering into salvation. Because if we start to get this, it'll end this present age and his rule is over. The devil's rule is over. And so when we go into churches, Kathy and I go into churches a lot of times, and we'll be praising and worshiping God. And, and look, I, and again, I want to make this clear to the people on the Internet. This isn't talking about people who when they come in and they're foolishly clamorous, people that are looking at them wondering, what, why are they that way? That's not a cane. A cane is somebody who gets angry, and their countenance falls, and they start to kill. They want to kill. Remember what Jesus, remember Jesus and the Pharisees? See, he was dealing with a bunch of canes. And you've got to understand something. Me preaching this to the canes won't straighten the canes out. Wouldn't you think it would? If you read the Bible to them, wouldn't you think they'd say, hey, the Bible does say that. We need to do that. We need to change. Jesus did that. He would confront them with the very Bible that they were carrying. They didn't have scriptures, parchments. He would confront them with the very word they claimed to stand on, and not one time do we ever have them. I'm not saying God couldn't do it, that he couldn't save a cane. I'm just saying we don't have one instance where, the, where those guys went out and said, you know, our Bible does say that. We need to start doing what, what, our, what, we just, what he just said for us to do. They always went out and did what? Tried to fix, they plotted how to kill him. Cain. So me explaining it isn't going to save the Cain. They're not going to say, oh yeah, it does say praise God. I'm going to look that word up. Yeah, it does mean foolish. To I need to start being foolish to clamorous. I need to start giving my first to God. No, they're not. They're going to write us a nasty letter. It's not going to do any good. But I'm speaking to those out there that are wondering. You know, they wonder. Why is it that those people are so crazy? Why is it that they're so foolishly clamorous for God? Why are we so joyful? See, how, you know, we learned the other night that how did we, how did Cain, uh, how did we know that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and, and we don't, didn't, didn't accept Cain's? Well, how do we know now when God accepts our first but he, but he doesn't accept their some? Because they're looking at you being overjoyed and they ain't got that. And they're wondering why they don't. They're wondering why God's accepting you, but not them. Because you're having a great time in God. You can't wait to be in church. You can't wait to sing the songs. And you're getting a real charge out of it. But they're looking at it and they're saying, what do they have? See, now I'm not talking about people who question, you know, they're looking at maybe Cassie or, or Paul or somebody that's really, you know, going crazy. And they're saying, 
What do they have that I don't have? You know, I'm, I wonder about that. That looks kind of strange to me. That, I'm, that's not a cane. But those are the people that I'm talking to. Those are the people that will look it up, and they'll change, and they'll look at the word praise up, and they'll look at the, the Bible scriptures, and they'll say, you know, maybe I do need to start doing that. Maybe I do need to start. I need to start out somewhere. You know, if I've always done this, maybe now I can do this. If I've always done this, maybe I can do this. If I've done this, maybe I can do this. And if I've always done this, maybe I can do this. Well, I just don't think adults should act that way. Well, I really don't care. <laughs> just show me Scripture where I'm not supposed to act that way and I'll, I'll oblige with you. Yeah. Come on, Cain, show me. I don't, uh, you guys got to realize that when we worship God, I don't have a spirit of cool. Do you know what the spirit of cool is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's based upon fear is what it is. See, that's what I mean. Your, your personality is directed by fear because you don't want anybody laughing at you or making fun of you. But you see, I found something out. All those people that make fun of me, they don't care about me anyway. So why do I care? They never helped me pay a light bill. Well, they haven't. They haven't helped me cut wood. They haven't helped me do anything. They haven't come out and mowed my yard, painted my house, swept my chimney, fixed all the busted stuff that seems to be busting all the time and our, you know, appliances and water pipes and Frozen toilets, <laughs> roof leaks. Well, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. So we'll go into churches, and we're going to praise the way we've always praised. Okay, back to Psalm 149. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of His faithful people. Now notice we're in the assembly. So somebody's going to say, well, I, I act foolishly clamorous when I'm in the shower. Okay, that's fine. I'll accept that. I don't, that's good. But this says in the assembly. That means when you're assembled together to be foolishly clamorous. <clears throat> it says, let Israel rejoice in their maker. Rejoice. You know what rejoicing is? It says, let the people of Zion be glad in their king. What's rejoicing? What's being glad? Come on. Celebrating. Celebrating. Lightheartedness. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Because God has come down and he has touched our lives. And when he touches our lives, our gratitude comes out. See, people who have not been touched by God... and. I'm, you know, I'm not, yeah, they're not going to be grateful, and I'm not criticizing that. If you've never been touched by God, you don't know what I'm talking about. And yeah, you don't know what you're missing. Let them, oh boy, this is the one that gets us. Let them praise his name with dancing. Who dances here? Who danced in the world? Whoever just danced in the world? Anybody ever danced? Come on. And, or how many? Yeah, you have. Jackson, you've danced. Good for you. <clears throat> I like people who are honest. Thank you. How many of you, when you were little kids, you'd twirl around? I used to do that all the time. That was fun. I don't think I'd do so much now. It makes you, well, not only dizzy, but, you know, it does f makes you feel kind of irpy if you do it too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Allie, she dances. Mm -hmm. Did you raise your hand? Okay, good for you. 
She just spins one way and spins another. If you want to see, look, if you want to see, if you want to see a definition of this, just watch some of the little kids that come in here, the two and three year olds. Oh, no, they all do it. I mean, they'll they just stand there and they'll just go like this because they can't hold. They don't got no balance, you know. But they know when they hear music, and they'll be in their diapers, you know, and they'll, they'll just be going like this because they know that's what they're supposed to do. And that's what praising him with the dance is. A command, not a suggestion. This is the legal way to do it. We're going to be legalistic today. <laughs> I'm going to break that. Somewhere. <laughs> Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. Those are instruments, right? For the Lord takes delight, or the Lord takes pleasure. I'm going to go flip over here to the New King James. I always get on the NIV. <clears throat> it says, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. And that's one of the reasons we do it is because we want to give him desire. You know, it's really hard to get people in the world when they come into church, or even most church people, to actually get them to think about somebody other than them. See, most people come to church to get something for themselves. Very difficult to get people to, give, to get them to give God something that he likes. They figure if they show up twice a year for church, then God's happy. Yeah, they gave some. That's what we've created. And they think that he's pleased with that. Remember that guy that David Wilkerson said dropped a dollar in the plate? David Wilkerson says, all of creation thanks you for your generosity. <laughs> A whole dollar. But see, the guy probably thought, God's really pleased I'm giving this dollar. He gave some, didn't he? Just like Cain, they give some. Oh, yeah, and there's also the illegal. How about the, the sacrifices that are talked about in Malachi? Remember God says you bring your blemished and the blind? See, they were illegal, weren't they? They weren't given of the first. See, that, that is a, that's a legalistic term is to give the first. Is you want to give of the first to God. And then God gives you what's left to give some to what else you want to give it to. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. And, you know, that's what we're after here. You know, a lot of churches, <clears throat> I was sharing this with Brenda the other day, and I've shared it several, several times with people. I don't know if I, I think I've said it from here before. But most churches, or all churches, have a motivation. It's a, it's a core motivation of, of what they're after. Do you know what I mean by that? For instance, most churches, what's their motivation? I'm, no, I'm talking about most churches, not charismatic. Most churches, it's heaven. That's their motivation, it's heaven. Their whole motivation from, you can go there for 50 years, and almost every message is going to be pointing towards heaven. Right? And if you walk into that church and try to preach a message other than that, they may or may not be respectful and listen, or, not, or they, may not, they may be disrespectful and not listen, but it's really not going to be important to them because it doesn't have to do with their motivation. So if you go in there and tr to a church that's, ta that's about heaven all the time and could just go try to preach healing to them, what's going to happen? They may listen, they may not, but they're going to walk out and learn, well, I didn't like it. Well, that wasn't a very good message. Well, that didn't, you know, because of why? Because it wasn't their motivation. And then you can go to charismatics, like you said, most, most of them, a lot of them, their, their motivation is what? Healing, gifts, prosperity. And if it's like if it's prosperity and you go in and you try to teach a message on suffering, and when I say suffering, I'm talking about biblical suffering now. I'm not talking about the suffering that we suffer as the consequences of sin. I'm not talking about disease and fear and anxiousness and anxiety and uh, possession, de depression, what else? 
all of, I'm not talking about that kind of, I'm talking about the suffering that you take for being a Christian, the mocking, the persecution. That's, so if you go in and preach a suffering message to them, how are they going to receive it? You're not going to probably be invited back. You know, how many times have we heard the pastor that we listen to here on Wednesday night say, say, I got invited to that church once. Why? Because he came with a message different than their motivation. Our motivation here is salvation. Real salvation. Not getting people to say the prayer, but to get saved from the fear and the desires of the world that are driving them, that are controlling them, that are killing them. And, and as a result of that motivation, what's our, what, what does that lead to? We're trying to end this present system. That's our motivation. We're trying to implement, let's put it this way, we're trying to implement the victory that Jesus won for us at the cross. Now, everybody's going to tell you that, but they're telling you that with their motivation that's not really biblical. They're going to say, well, we're trying to do that to get people healed. Well, that's a little part of it. Well, we're trying to do that to get people to find it. Well, that's a little part of it. We're trying to get people into heaven. Well, that may be a real deal, right? Heaven may be a real place, right? I mean, it may be an actual place that we go, but there's a heaven here on earth that you can experience. The Bible says we're seated in heavenly places. But if you look at us, we don't look like we're sitting there very much. And so we're actually trying to experience, and that's our motivation, is salvation. So any message that anybody brings in here, even if they bring a healing message or a financial message, guess what? That gets applied to salvation. So we can listen to it and like it. Yeah. We learned the other night about... Uh, Making every effort to enter in, right, to salvation. Make every effort. And it was interesting because as I, when I was listening to the video that we were watching, I was thinking, you know, the whole message, it was speaking individually. But I told Kathy, how about corporately? There's a lot of people over the years that have spent more effort trying to get other people to enter into salvation than them own selves. How many people in this body have poured into other people? And when I mean poured into other people, I'm not talking about once or twice. I'm talking about for years. On the phone, on the email, driving, you know, praying. There's been a lot of effort made that you would not experience in most churches. They're not going to make that kind of effort. A lot of effort. And a lot of it has gone seemingly out the window, hasn't it? There's been people that we've spent years with, haven't, and they're no longer here and are back in the world. So not only is there you make your own effort to enter into salvation, but you've got to put on top of that the effort that people are making to get other people into salvation. That can be a big effort and a costly one. But that's what we're about here. That's what we're about here. Is we're trying to get people to enter into salvation. The real salvation. That's real biblical. So it says he will beautify the humble. Now what does he mean by humble? Well, because you are humbling yourself to his word. You're, becoming, you're humbling yourself to him. Why is, it, why is it humiliating to humble him? Do you think God's up there mocking and laughing at you when you're twirling and when you're, when you're being foolishly clamorous? Why does he use the word humble? Because he knows how all the canes are going to treat you. He knows the canes are going to make fun of you. And they're going to speak evil about you. And they're probably going to kill some of us. That's why he uses the word humble. But he'll beautify those people. Those people that will put aside their human fears of being accepted by man and will do the things that God likes, he'll beautify with salvation. And if you don't humble yourself, no salvation. You may have the mental concept of what it is. You may claim it. But we'll watch your life. And we'll see what drives you. And so will everybody else. 
He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the, sing, let the saints be joyful in glory. So what's that mean? Let them be joyful in glory. Well, when you're making a fool of yourself, you're in glory. When I say, and I've got to limit that, because some people make a fool of themselves, but they're not really doing it for God. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think we discussed it last week. So, uh, any of you watch the NFL? <laughs> and you watch some of those people make a touchdown, and you see some of the stuff they do. I can't even do it, you know, those, those black people. Well, they got the rhythm, you know what I mean? They go, you know, they do all of that stuff, and they're doing it in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Now, if they, listen, if they did that for God, how do you think they'd be treated? They wouldn't have 50,000 fans cheering them, would they? You see what I'm saying? That it's, they're, they're foolishly clamorous. They're joyful in their glory. And we can be too. Now, I don't know if I'm ready yet for any of you to start going like this. <laughs> I'll try. I won't be a cane, but I will look at you and say, I wonder what they've got there. <laughs> Come on now. What? <laughs> they do it on their tiptoes, don't they? You know, I don't know. I can't do it like they do it. They're pretty, they do it. <clears throat> well, hopefully all our Internet viewers have had some experience with NFL football because... <laughs> It says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. What for? Now, when it, says, when it says, may the praise of God be in their mouths, that means all the time, folks. This is a lifestyle. This isn't something we just do when we come to church and then we go back to, to cursing the rest of the week. This is something that we do when we're out and about in the community, when you're out and about driving, when, whenever it is you are, you have the high praises of God in your mouth all the time. Right? Yep. And so when I'm looking out my window, when I'm walking through the woods, when I'm, I'm just constantly looking and praising God for the trees, for the what, you know, look at them, they're all different, they got different bark, they got different limbs, it's just everything. You know, and everything be starts to come alive. And you look at the sky, and you look at the stars, and you look at, you know, everything. The high, even what man has created, and you can praise God in that. You know, the highways, cars. I'm glad I didn't have to come here on a horse this morning. Yeah. Heaters. And we've made, gave, gave, given testimony in this place that a lot of times when you're down or when you feel bad or when something's happened to you that's wrong, if you'll just take that time and start praising God in what you're doing, your countenance will change. Your attitude will change. And you start thanking Him for what you have as an, just as an American. That you're not in a third world country having to scrounge for food in a dump. Or dig a hole. And a double-edged sword in their hands. Of course, that's the Word of God. What for? Why do we do this? What's another reason? To inflict vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. To bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with shackles of iron. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean to, to bind up physical nations like Russia, the Ukraine, France. Spain, the United States, doesn't mean that. It means those nations that live inside of you that have you bound up. You're always at war. And they have you bound. And I used this illustration, I think, last week. We walk into an, another church, say a denominational church, and they're not as flamboyant as we are. 
and they're singing, they, maybe they have, they may be delving into that. They may be starting to grow in, in the praise and worship of God. And so they have maybe a few choruses, and they'll start singing a chorus, you know, or even a good hymn. You know, a lot of the hymns are good. They have good wording to them, you know. For instance, there was one we used to sing. Remember this one? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And I used to sing that and think, uh, what power? Because there wasn't no power. It was a great song, but what power was it? Well, see, that was written when there was actually power going forth. But now we're just singing the shell of it in our churches, that, and there's no power going forth. So there's some good hymns out there. But you go there, and we would visit there, and you want to lift your hands. You know, there is power, power. You want to go like that. But you feel something keeping you bound down. What is that? That's one of those kings. That's one of those nations. And it's got you bound in a fetter of iron. Because you want to do it, and we've even talked with people in these churches. How many times have you talked to them and they said, well, I want to do that, but there's something holding me back. You should know exactly what it is. It's one of those nations. It's one of those kings that's holding the back. And, they're, they, and you're bound with fetters of iron. But when you break forth and you start going like this, what happens? You put them in fetters of iron. You put them in prison. You, and and, and it, it actually inflicts punishments upon them. Remember we used to sing those songs about, you know, I, don't, I can't remember the wording. We, we're going to get the devil or we're going to put him under our feet. Or, it, it, well, you really want to do that? Then start being foolishly clamorous towards God and that'll do it. Just yelling it out in the air is not going to do it. There's a legal way of binding them up. And then there's an illegal way. It says what? To carry out the sentence written against them. Whoops. Went back to NIV, didn't I? Golly. To execute on them, this, this is New King James, to execute on them the written judgment. It says, this honor have his charismatic saints. This honor have all his Baptist saints. All his Methodist saints. All what? All his Catholic saints, right? All his saints. It says this honor have all his saints. It's an honor. See, it's an honor. But I can read that to the Canes, and they're not, it's not going to click on them. We've tried, folks. I've tried. It, you just can't talk to them. They don't care what the Bible says. They only want to give some because they want to save their first for something else. It says, this honor have all his saints, and then he says, he ends it the same way he started it, praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. So this is what we do. And this is why we act the way that we act. Hopefully this comes out to sound right in the camera, on the internet. And it's a vitally important thing to enter in, to get the, to enter into salvation is to know how to praise correctly, or you'll never enter in. You may know the member the member the Pharisees says they studied the scriptures daily, and they hadn't entered in. They knew their Bibles a lot better than we do. They knew all the Jewish language. They knew all the jots and tittles of the law. They knew every. A slant on the words, and yet they hadn't entered into salvation. So without praise and worship, you won't enter in. Okay? A glorious privilege is what her Bible says. Any questions? <clears throat> Nothing? Okay, we're going to become foolishly clamorous here, hopefully. Do we have any hot songs? First couple of hot songs? Okay. 
<laughs> I need some hot songs. <laughs> Okay, well, i got to pray. Father, we just thank you once again for your word this morning. And God, I just thank you that this goes out over the Internet, that people understand where, where it is that we're coming from, that, God, we want everyone, everyone within the sound of our voices to enter into this salvation that you've provided for us. And, Father, we thank you. There is a legal way of doing things. Spiritually, there's a legal way of doing things. And God, I thank you that we're gonna, we will find, and that, that's really what we pray about usually at every service, is God, we're trying to find the legal way to heal. We're trying to find the legal way to prosperity and the legal way to salvation because, God, it is a, you have a legal way. And so, God, I just thank you, Lord, that you continue to strengthen us in this, continue to show us, continue to uh, cause us to move forward in everything that you're giving to us so that we may be the ones to bring about the victory that Jesus brought to the earth. God, that's our heart. It's our desire. Not only for ourselves, like the Scripture says, we not, ought not just to watch out for our own interests, but for the interests of others. And so, God, we want to see others walk in this. It's not enough that we just walk in it. We want to see other people walk in the things of the kingdom of God. God, there's a real joy in seeing people set free. And so, God, we just thank you for that. Strengthen us. And God, as we prepare to give you pleasure, that God, we will. And that is our desire. We're here for you, not for us. In Jesus' name, amen.